Welcome to the Cables to Clouds podcast. Cloud adoption is on the rise and many network infrastructure professionals are being asked to adopt a hybrid approach. As individuals who have already started this journey, we would like to empower those professionals with the tools and the knowledge to bridge the gap. Hello, and welcome back to the Cables to Clouds podcast. My name is Tim McConaughey, and joining me as always are my two co-hosts, Alec Pers- uh, Alex Perkins <laughs> and uh, Chris Miles. How are you guys doing today? Alex, what's going up over there in Nashville? Uh, not too much. You know, just had our uh, Memorial Day three-day weekend. So I uh, didn't do a whole lot. My wife actually had to work Sunday and Monday. So there's not much that of hurts. a three-day weekend. Yeah. Um, but the kids are not this week, but next week is the last last week of school. So they're, there's nothing right now. They're just doing like testing and, you know, cleaning up their stuff and having all these end-of-year parties. So just getting ready nice. for the summer. Yeah. Yeah, my kids are doing the what do they call them EOGs? They're they're doing those as well. Yeah, yep, exactly. They got two of them this week. I think reading and like reading and math. I think are the two we got this week. Yeah. What about you, Chris? How are your? Uh, are you doing your EOGs this week too? <laughs> I was gonna say, man, I don't even know what that is. Um, so yeah, I'm doing I'm doing some reading and a little bit of math. So yeah, sure, I'm doing those. Um, yeah, man, I actually have a lot going on. I just, I just, uh, moved house. Um, so I'm in a new apartment, hopefully, hopefully no jackhammers. Um, and as we were talking about before we hit record, there's, well, there's no jackhammers. There are about a million birds outside. Um, there's a, uh, a lot of rainbow lorikeets and cockatoos, um, around this area, which is, which is great for me, but not, not great for recording an audio podcast, but you know, we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. Um, I actually had a big accomplishment. We got the, the cockatoos to come to the window and we were feeding them. So I have, I have made some new friends. Um, very excited about that. The lorikeets are a little bit harder to get, but yeah. No, uh, kookaburras? Kiwis? Kookaburras? Oh, uh, no. the, the, the kookaburras are, are, uh, I can hear them. They're a little bit further out. They like big trees and whatnot. I, I still have to get a sample of um, their the the call that they make because it it sounds completely insane. It sounds like a howling monkey or something. Um, but yeah, so a lot of a lot of I'm becoming a bird person apparently. So um, yeah, I'll be probably providing updates as uh, as months go on. So middle age. So basically, you're hitting middle age, right? <laughs> Yeah, dude. What is it? Like, soon Picking, as, I hit, uh, as soon as weird. I hit my mid thirties, I'm like, damn, dude, birds are so cool. <laughs> yeah. You're like, what is that? Oh yeah. And then you can start identifying them by the, by the noise. Yeah. I downloaded an app on my phone where I can like listen to the call and like determine what, what kind of bird it is. So that's, you know, I've accepted it. This is, this is me now. So it's okay. How about you, Tim? Uh, let's see. What do I have going on this week? I, I'd like to say that I have like very exciting things going on, but, uh, the truth is I think I'm just coming out of, uh, I, I, I've spent, my wife and I have spent so much time the last week and a half playing, uh, the new legend of Zelda game that like, I don't even remember doing anything else of, of value in that time, to be honest. I'm I'm this close to buying a switch because it looks so fun. So I will I will probably be doing that in the next the next couple of weeks. No, I, I definitely recommend it. Uh it's even for non gamers, it's like it's like just on the right side of casual for casual gamers and very fun for those who uh who also already game. So anyway. All right, let's get started. We have a guest with us tonight. Uh, I know this is very rare for us, but uh, we brought in a guest with us tonight um, at Sharp Network on Twitter. Yvonne, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Like you said, it's the day after Memorial Day. We've had some family time and I had the day off to take care of some stuff going on with me. So uh, it's been good. Nice long weekend and happy to be here. Awesome. Did you guys do anything fun for the Memorial Day? Did you do a barbecue? 
Uh, well, we, yeah, we, we hung out with some folks on Sunday night and, uh, you know, hot dogs and chips and some things like that. And then yesterday we took the kiddos to Holiday World. So I'm about an hour's drive away from Santa Claus, Indiana, where there's this lovely little amusement park called Holiday World. And we, uh, we, we took the kiddos and hung out with some friends and yeah, made a day of it. So it's been good. They, they still have free Pepsi products there. Uh, they still have free soft drinks there, yes. So free Pepsi products. So all the Diet Mountain Dew I can drink. So if you know me, that's a huge win. I saw that face, but still. Um, yeah, yeah. So free free soft drinks and, uh, you know, water park, amusement rides, great roller coaster. So we had a good time. Is it? It's actually called Santa Claus? Like that's the, the name of the The town's place? name is wow. Santa Claus, Indiana. And the park is themed by holiday, so you've got a Christmas section, and you've got a Thanksgiving section, and a Fourth of July section, and Halloween section, and yeah, it's fun. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Sounds like Bush Gardens, but like very different. <laughs> it's like it's like if Bush Gardens was a state fair. I would uh, I would maybe compare it to that. Huh. Okay. It's a very non-commercialized, affordable, like family-owned kind of a thing. So it's nice. That's really cool. I have to look that up. I've never, I had never heard of it before you mentioned it. So one of the reasons that we brought Yvonne here is because she's awesome. But on top of that, <laughs> for those who may not already know Yvonne, which will be like three of you, and you probably all got in tech last week. Um, <laughs> Yvonne is a, um, sorry, I don't remember the exact type of, is, is it solution strategist with Google or is it strategist so, or like what's the, um, I'm, so I'm, I'm a couple of different things. So first of all, I'm a customer engineer, which okay. means I am, I am on the sales side. So I help customers adopt Google technology, but at the same time, my very specific role is a technical transformation lead. So I work with uh, customers that are doing either new and interesting things or they're using a lot of different technologies. Um, so think of what I do is how you would have like an enterprise architect, um, you know, inside of a inside of an enterprise who helps make sure all the technology works together. I do a lot of that um, on the Google side for our customers. Gotcha. And th and you and you, you know you've been doing this for a little while now, but this isn't where you started, right? Like before, I remember you know even years ago, you were a network engineer just like the rest of us, right? Like, can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, I, I've been um, I've been with Google Cloud almost three years now, if you can believe it. Um, but before that, um, I started my career in generalist like SMB space. So I worked for very small bars, and so we did everything. Uh, from, you know, networking to servers. Um, this is back when people still ran their own exchange servers on prem. Um, and, uh, and, and so did a lot of that. Um, but eventually, um, uh, got a role at a large healthcare enterprise on their networking team. And so I spent, you know, eight years there doing lots of networking slash network security stuff, firewalls, VPNs. Um, and, and so did, did that for, for several years. Um, and then moved over into um, into pre-sales first at VMware and then at Google. So, yeah, that's kind of the quick version. So I'm, I'm curious, like, um, what kind of like got you? Because, I mean, I, you know, you've been uh, doing a lot of stuff for a lot of years, right? So what kind of led you? And I don't want to get too, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but I'm, I just wanted to ask because I was curious. What kind of led you to, you know, I'm a networker, I'm doing this, I'm doing the thinware, and then to, to Google? I, I guess really the question for me is, you know, being a network engineer and transitioning to cloud, I'm curious, how'd you end up at Google? Uh, that's really an interesting story. First of all, it's very fortunate. Um, I'll, I'll say that first, first off, because, um, I really never would have, um, been like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to go like get a job at Google. Like I, I just didn't see myself in that, in that sphere. So, um, I, I was at VMware. Um, as, as really, uh, just a solutions engineer. So I supported customers across the VMware stack. And so, um, I, th that was, that was really kind of a bigger leap for me than the leap to Google. And we can talk about that. Um, but, uh, Google was at a point, this was in 2000 and they were, they were kind of growing a national team and they were looking for people with, um, that strong infrastructure experience. Um, and, and a recruiter reached out. 
Um, so I, um, I got a message on LinkedIn from a re- recruiter, um, uh, talking about a role. And, um, and my first thought was, you know, somebody's trying to spam me or somebody's trying to, to fish me. Like they, they want me to click a link and fill out a bunch of stuff and then steal my info. And so it's like, okay, email me and then we'll talk. And so they emailed me and, um, it was legit. And so I was like, well, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is something I can do or that I'm qualified to do, but at the very least, it's an opportunity to interview with Google. So I'm going to do that. Um, and it, and it, it went really well. So, um, I started off on an infrastructure modernization team. So that team focuses on our compute prod, uh, products. So like compute engine, um, GKE, so Kubernetes engine, cloud run, um, those, that, that, that platform of services, more infrastructure and service and, and, and things like that. Um, and, and also got familiar with our networking stack. Um, and, and then, um, we, we kind of realized that there was this gap in, uh, in, in this more overarching architecture role. Um, and so I, I was kind of doing some of that work anyway, cause it's how I think. Um, more like how do we make this whole thing successful? Not just how do I get in and help you figure out how much compute engine is going to cost to run, you know, this many VMs. Um, and so, um, after I've been there about a year, they created this team in this role and I moved over to it. So, yeah. It's, it's funny that you say that you, you did that and you never really saw yourself potentially even going to Google. Like that was, uh, something you didn't see yourself doing because I remember I, I, I can definitely count on both hands how many times I've seen people make leaps to Google that, that I've just seen in the networking industry. And I'm like, wow, they went to Google. Like I didn't even like, I didn't expect to see people go to Google just cause I didn't know what they were offering in these terms. Right. Um, so it's, it's funny to hear you say that. Yeah, it was, it was definitely, um, a, a pleasant surprise. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and like I said, it was one of those things. I think it helped that I wasn't super nervous about the whole interview process because I was like, you know what? I'm going to treat this like a learning experience. I'm going to go in. I'm going to experience it. At the very least, I can say I've done it. Um, and I think that helped not be nervous and I was more myself and, um, it, and approached it more conversationally. And I think that that worked in my favor. Um, but, but yeah, so it was, I know a lot of people, um, have tried hard and interviewed a lot of times to get, to get a role at Google. Um, and, and I'm not going to say that my experience was normative. Um, and again, which is why I started the whole thing with, you know, felt super fortunate, you know, cause it, it just, the timing just happened to be just right. You know, it's funny, like hindsight's always twenty twenty, but just from the story you've given about your transition like all the way through from the beginning to google it seems like you were never really locked into one domain anyway it's like you were always some kind of general like more general infrastructure or like when you were saying you worked at a small bar and you guys did all kinds of different stuff and then at vmware you were using the whole stack right it's, it's interesting how that kind of again hindsight, hindsight's twenty twenty, but it's almost like it played into what you're doing now yeah, so I I have always been um, more concerned about being able to successfully and helpfully solve problems than I have about a particular technology domain. Because even even before like where my story started when I was talking to you guys, like I, so I went to college and studied computer science, did did web development for a while. Um, and, and, and then there were, there were more opportunities where I was in the, in the like VAR and integrator space. So that's, that's kind of where I, I went. And so it's been a combination of what can I do and where is their opportunity? Right. I, I'm, so I, I have never been super married to a particular technology. And, um, I, I was talking to my son who's, who's 24. Um, is software developer. And, uh, and he would ask, you know, and, and they're, they're building mostly on Azure. And he's like, are you familiar with this product or this thing? I'm like, no, describe it to me. And I'd be like, oh, okay. Well, that thing is a layer of abstraction. He's like, yes, that's what it is. He's like, oh, well, and then there's this thing. I'm like, okay, that's that. 
once you've been in the industry long enough, like there are only so many different oh, yeah. types of things. And eventually you just learn to recognize them. And, um, you know, whether it's a distributed system or whether it's a relational database or whether it's, you know, um, and, and, and so even though I don't know as much like how to configure all the bits and bytes exactly, I do understand how they fit together. And I think that like, let me understand the operating principles behind whatever this thing is has served me well, as opposed to, you know, let me be sure I'm super sharp on the exact syntax to type into my keyboard to enable this feature. Yeah. Right. Um, because that stuff, first of all, changes. Uh, you can Google it and figure it out. And, um, and, and so I've always, even when I was in school, like even when I was a kid, like I wanted to understand the principles underneath the thing. Um, and that's, that served me well. I think that's a good, uh, that's a really good way to describe the difference, in my opinion, from what you're saying, between someone who is like an architect level versus someone who's like an engineer level. Engineers tend to be very focused on the problem at hand, on the specifics of, of that. And you may not agree and that, that, that's okay. But I, I, whenever I try to explain like, what is an architect, you know, people are like, what, what's the difference between an architect and a, a, an engineer? I'm like, well, an architect is concerned with systems with solutions at a, you know, interoperating parts, but also the higher level uh, piece of it versus what I find when I was an engineer, I was very focused on solving the particular problem that I was, you know, it was the task to solve, if you will. So uh, I think it's really cool to hear you, hear you say that. I, I kind of agree. Well, and, um, you know, I, and for, and for those who may be familiar with Network Collective, the, the, the podcast, um, that, that Jordan, um, Russ and I and Phil was, was involved in it some too, did, did a while back. You know, I think we were recording a, um, uh, uh, <laughs> an episode on segment routing. And uh, Nick Russo was on. And, uh, if, if you know Nick, like he's, he's a master. He's a good friend. Um, and I just had an epiphany, like, this is just not what I want. You know, like, I just wasn't energized by right. understanding the deep, you know, details of how segment routing works. And, and, and had a maturity enough to feel like that was okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and, and I think like, so that, that's been the right, it's been the right path for me. It's not the right path for everybody. And it doesn't even mean that one is necessarily better than the other because we need high functioning people in, in both types of roles. Um, but, but I've, I've really gravitated more toward the architect kind of thinking, um, really starting to think about what, what does it mean to lead a team of people? Um, not, not quite there yet, but, but, probably going to be exploring that over the next year or two um just because those are the things that i you know it, it, when it went you know, i'm not reading um python books in my spare time anymore you know i'm reading books on leadership and and how do you get a group of people that are very gifted to work together to accomplish a thing as opposed to you know how do you make the thing work and it is, it's just a transition that I'm going through. Um, and that's okay. You know, I think sometimes we act like folks who move into certain spheres, like either they're selling out or they're giving up or they're doing, you know, or, um, and that's just not always the case is sometimes as you change your interests change and, you know, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious just reading back through some of your blog posts that you've you've kind of made made this transition because a lot of your stuff yeah. i was reading one i have to look this up about like the western typology there's all these yeah. things that you write about that i'm like they're really interesting stuff but they're not things that you hear a lot of people in our industry talking about like you said it's not a podcast about segment routing right it's it's much more yeah. holistic like look, taking the bigger picture and looking at things but, but like my most read post ever <laughs> was like how to push a VLAN down to a wireless access point uh, yeah. when you're configuring it with ice. You know, it was like a very specific, like, and it took me forever to figure it out because the documentation wasn't super clear. And I t had to do a lot of like, mm, how does this work? And then I was like, oh, like, I need to write this down because nobody else has done it. Um, 
or, or at least I couldn't find it. It's not that people hadn't done it, but right. I, but I couldn't find find do- clear documentation on how to do this very specific thing. So so yeah, like even back through my blog post, you can kind of see. You know, we go on from like detailed how to configure this thing and make it work to some of the more industry stuff. Like when I was doing networking field day, there's some posts about that. And then the, you know, the the culture stuff, Westrum. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and it's all she shit all the time. Um, and, And now it's, you know, more like, how do we think about what we do? You know, Um, so, yeah. I wanted to and and. You got a little bit ahead of me, but I, 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 that's okay because I was going to go there eventually. I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, I wanted to kind of establish kind of what you are, what you do, kind of why we're, we're talking to you. But I also wanted to, to ask you a little bit more about, I mean, you've been podcasting much longer than we have. I mean, you've, you've done multiple, I mean, Network Collective was one of the first podcasts I ever really, and I, I, I admit it freely that I, had, I didn't ever really listen to a lot of podcasts, but like Network Collective was one that I listened to a lot. So I wanted, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um you know just the time the other things outside of of just being a technologist that you've been you know have done for a long time uh, all around the industry like nfd and and you know network collective and stuff yeah so um one of the things like i love to um i love to be on podcasts i love to you know connect with the community um i don't love running one um, <laughs> don't blame you. <laughs> I see you guys laugh. You know, I mean, it's a lot of coordination. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of scheduling. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy to, to, to come on and talk, but, uh, yeah, I just don't enjoy the coordination and I'm not really willing to invest to pay somebody else to do it. So, you know, that, that's where we are. Um, you know, and, and network collective really grew out of, um, uh, the the tech field day community. Um, it, it was really Jordan's brainchild. And he's like, hey, who's wants to do this? And Phil and I were like, hey, I might be interested. Um, and, and so we we really didn't expect it to be um, as as, you know, as as well received as it was. Um, it, and it was I think it was great for all of us. Um, and it 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 served its purpose for a time. Um and, you know, really proud of the work that we did there. Um, yeah. So it was, it was, but it was, it was really just a, um, a Slack conversation one day. Um, and as far as, um, like networking field day, um, that was a huge growth experience for me because until then, I had always been like on the customer side and really looking only through the lens of an enterprise customer. Um, but I think that the thing that network field day that I saw there was just a broader view of the industry, how the industry works, what vendors care about. Um, and I, I you know, I kind of got exposed and got to know just some really interesting, fabulous people. Um, you know, I, um, Keith Townsend, for example, um, met him several times at, at, at Tech Field Day, Networking Field Day events. Um, um, you know, Drew and, and Greg from Packet Pushers and Ethan, of course, who's fabulous. Um, and so that, but I think for, for me, like that experience was, was pretty formative. And also, um, that group really put a lot of effort into into being inclusive, into saying, "Hey, we need your voice. Your voice matters. Speak up." Um, which again, um, I you know, it was something I needed to hear. I didn't know I needed to hear it, but I did. Um, and and they were they were always fabulous. And and you know, I, and I still um, you know I'm, I'm writing a uh, column a month for, for packet pushers really, really enjoy that. And, um, they're kind of like, you know, write whatever's on your mind. And I'm like, okay, you know, tell me when I, when I go too far or when I, you know, <laughs> veer off the, the, uh, the beaten path too much, but, uh, really, really enjoyed having, having that outlet and it's low friction and, um, which is kind of, I'm, I'm trying to be low friction these days. So it's good. Yeah. I was going to say that though. The most recent uh, post I think that you have, uh, at least at the time of uh, recording this, was, um, you know, people aren't stupid just because they don't understand the technology. Um, I feel like, you know, you make a a great point in there that, like, 
if you're going to categorize people in your mind, do it by strengths. Um, and I think you need to kind of do that with yourself as well. Right. And, and if you understand, like, if you had that moment where you're like during a segment rounding conversation where you're like, this isn't, <laughs> this wasn't, isn't what I see myself doing the next, you know, 10 years, like, you know, maybe you need to cater your strengths to, to, to fit your path. Right. Or something like that. But, um, yeah, I just thought that was a great point. Um, we'll put it in the show notes, but, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, very important to, to, be able to see the bigger picture and understand that, that, you know, it is not just, you know, changing VLANs and, and individuals productivity. It's, it's a business, right? So you need to, to be able to see the full picture. Um, and maybe that'll kind of segue to the next thing. Like, cause I wanted to ask, you know, you moved to being a strategist um, and all the strategists that I know, uh, yourself included are, are always very well-spoken, um, very good at telling a story, um, which, which I, I really admire, but like in your, in your terminology, what is a strategist? And, and like for people that don't interface with them on a regular basis, what, what is, what is your primary, uh, goals and, and objectives? Yeah. Well, and I don't, I don't even know if I think of myself in that term with, with that term, but, but I think so, uh, th- there are a few things um, that I highly value. Um, and I think, and as I've, you know, gotten older uh, and maybe a little wiser, I think one of the things I value more now um, is seeing, seeing through multiple perspectives. Right. And, and, you know, when, um, and, and to try and, um, you know, it's, it's, Everything is is like 3D or 4D chess, right? I, I think we so often want to take problems and we want to narrow them down until we can wrangle them and wrap our arms around them and make sense of them. And I think one of the things um, and, and really one of the stated um, qualities for, for Googlers is the ability to thrive in ambiguity. And I think part of that kind of a role is to be able to walk into a situation that is very fuzzy, that is ambiguous, that is like uncharted territory and to figure out uh, sometimes and, and a lot of times you even have to define the problem. Right. What <laughs> what are we really trying to achieve here? Um, and then, you know, define the problem. Figure out, you know, okay, what, what do we need to measure? And, and then also, what is the entire universe of solutions that could be used to solve this problem? And sometimes like technology isn't at the top of the list. You know, sometimes it's like we need to reorganize how our teams work together, or sometimes it's we need to change how we're sharing information back and forth, or sometimes it's, um, we actually are over rotating on, you know, what we're spending on things versus what we're focusing on and, and to, to make our organization healthier, right? That, that those are sometimes solutions to the problems as well. And so I think a lot of it is let's look back. Let's define the problem that we're trying to solve. And then not looking at it merely through the tools I am competent to wield, right? It's the whole, if every, if every, if every, yeah. well, you have a hammer, every problem's a nail, right? Um, and, um, yeah. And, and to think, okay, you know, I have to understand enough about the universe of potential solutions out there. Or, or, or sometimes it's like, oh, we need something that does X. That doesn't really exist today, right? And in, and then that may be a conversation with the product team and saying, "Hey, have you thought about this?" Or the, you know, so it's 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 really taking that broad view and trying to solve that more of a brain teaser kind of a puzzle as opposed to, um, "Hey, I need you know I need to connect site A in location." X with site B and location Y, which is a very clearly defined problem, right? I think 
and I'll let you guys ask a question in a minute. I've talked for a long time, but, but I think for me, the thing that I see now that I didn't 10 years ago in my career, 15 years ago was that a lot of work goes into getting most individual contributors ready to work, right? Like by the time somebody comes to you and says, Hey, we need a network here. Like there has been a ton of work already done to make that request. And it's real work. It's not, it's not bogus work. It's real work that somebody has to do. And if they don't do it well, then everybody suffers. Right. And that has been sort of epiphanal for me in the last several years. Does that help? That was a lot. It does help. Yeah. That was good. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious, actually. So what is, what is, because obviously at Google, Google's a very, very large organization, right? And then some of the problems that Google has to solve are going to be, you know, very unique to where uh, compared to what, you know, customer problems that you need to solve. So how many, what would you say the spread looks like on those kind of unique Google problems to solve, which, which obviously empowers customers later down the line versus solving just straight up customer problems? Yeah. So for me, I'm in Google Cloud. And as a customer engineer, my, my entire job is how do we take um, the Google Cloud solutions that exist and help customers solve problems with them? So that is that is my focus. Now, I can speak like more generally. Um, I don't know um, how many folks, because you've got a networking background or, or is familiar with Cloud Spanner, but but it's Cloud Spanner is pretty cool. Um, it is a it is a globally consistent relational database with five nines of uptime. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is, it is also the, the technology that runs YouTube is what was turned into cloud spanner. Right. Oh, very cool. So, so (laughs) spanner um, it is, it it, it is, you know, you're not going to run, um, run a, a WordPress website on Spanner, right? Like it is a, it is a Cadillac kind of a solution. Um, but there are customers who need that, right? So for example, if, 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 if you're a bank and you want to, um, build a ledger on and, and build a suite of applications, um, on a database system that you know is going to be up. <laughs> you know, and you don't have to worry about backup. You don't have to worry about replication. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Like Spanner is a great solution for that. So more of what I do is like that kind of conversation that we just had. Right. So, uh, you know, a customer's like, hey, like we need, you know, th- this is what we need. These are kind of our requirements. And I'm like, OK, well, and and I can do that at a high level. But frankly, like once we get into like when they start talking about cap theorem, I have a data specialist I can pull in. Right. And so I go right. to them I'm like, OK, like we've defined the problem. We now know like here's here's kind of what they're trying to do now. My deep subject matter expert, can you come in and have a conversation with them about X and maybe get on an office hours call with their, you know, deep subject matter database people and talk to them about that. So um, those are the kinds of conversations that I'm having. Right. Um, and, and I'll do the same thing when it comes to infrastructure. Um, and and so I'm, I'm ve- the, the hardest thing for me is it's just so broad. Right. If you think about like a, a cloud portfolio, yeah. you've got data. Um, now you've got um, just the incredible interest in AI and ML technologies. Um, you've got um, uh, you've got your infrastructure and then you've got application modernization. Right. You've got SRE conversations. You've got DevOps. You've got, you know, um, it's it's just a lot. Right. right. And and I can't be you know, 300 level deep on all those things. No, nobody can. Yeah, no. Except for Chris. Chris could do it. I won't. (laughs) All I heard from that was there's that much. It's it's, it's that or sleep, but you can't do both. I was challenged to to run a WordPress website on Cloud Spanner. So that's that's what I heard from that. So somebody out there do it. If if you want to pay to try, Chris, you go right (laughs) ahead. 
We'll get that. We'll get that A <laughs> one money to pay for it. There you go. Oh, actually, um, so this was not in the list, uh, but you mentioned it. So I actually have to pivot just a little bit, Yvonne, and I'm not to push you on the spot and and not to to make you speak uh, for or against any particular technology. But uh, what's your hot take on the whole AI ML thing? Uh, the technology, how people are using it, where it's going, how companies are building it. Maybe just a you know. Two hour dissertation, if you would, please. <laughs> sure. Well, I, you, first of all, this is this is Yvonne's opinion. Um, yeah. I do think um, AI is going to change the way we work in the long run. I, I really do. Like, I, I, you know, I is it overhyped? Sure. Um, but I also think it is. It is going to change the landscape for knowledge work. Um, because just like. You know, we've used other technologies to remove some of the toil. I think AI is going to do that. Um, you know, I think um, the fear that ultimately AI is going to take away jobs. You know, I I, I, I kind of chuckle because I look back, you know, in, in the 70s and in the 50s and in the 30s. Uh, there was this, you know, they were always proclaiming that we were going to end up with a three day work week. You know, we're going to so we're going to make things so efficient that we're going to end up with a three day work week. Um, and ultimately, there's this concept. Um, I I may not be saying it right, but I believe it's called Javon's Paradox. Um, you can look it up on Wikipedia. But but the idea is that when you cr- increase the efficiency of a process, you also increase the consumption of that process. Right. And so <laughs> if, if you increase the efficiency of people writing code, what you're going to do is increase the demand for custom code. Right. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think w- right now we see lots of foolish people doing all kinds of foolish things with AI because they don't really understand what it is. It's, it's, it's not sentient. It, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't have a personality. It is really some amazing um, uh, statistical analysis of words and how words work and how we use language. And, um, and so it, and not just language, because you can you can you can create images with it and, and all that kind of good stuff, but it it is a technology that that will change how we work, and, and it, it is it is dis and it will be disruptive for knowledge workers. That but that doesn't disruption isn't always a bad thing, right? If you're willing to move with it, um, and so I think you know I don't think it's something to fear. I think it is something we need to understand. There's going to be some wild times ahead. As people try and figure out where it works and where it doesn't and what makes sense. And then, um, vendors swoop in and, and, and try to say, Hey, here's my shiny AI thing. Um, and, and all that'll shake out. Like that's, that's again, it's another cycle that the industry goes through. Um, I do think it's big though. I think it's a really big deal. And I think, um, I think that there will be social good that comes from it. And I think there will be social challenges that come from it. And we're just going to have to navigate those. I mean, it's, it's but it's not going to go away, right? It's here. Like the, the bell just doesn't untoll ever. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of my high level view. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not going to be the kind of person that's like, Oh, it's the end of the world, you know? Um, no, we'll, we'll figure it out how it works and, you know, and we'll do great and terrible things with it. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it's just going to become part of how the world works, I think. Just just like cell phones, right? I mean, but I do think it is as as revolutionary as, as the iPhone was. I think it's that we are in that kind of a moment. Yeah. I, you know, I'm willing to say that. To bring it back a little bit to the to the main topic. Sorry, everyone. But, no, it's good. Um, because I, I, I had a specific question about your, sure. I guess your kind of leeway when you deal with customers. And if you're allowed, like, do you have any influence on kind of trying to help fix like organizational toil, you know, helping fix structures and how teams operate with each other, stuff like, because that's a lot of the stuff that you write about and talk about. So I'm just curious if you get to have some of that influence thrown into your interactions. 
Well, yeah. So first of all, like uh, every one of the great things about um, being on the vendor side and working with lots of different customers is you get to see what's common across all of them. And then some of their and customers have personalities, like entire organizations have personalities. And um, and 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 some customers are open to hearing that and having that conversation. Some aren't. And, and that's okay. Just like some are interested in, in product A and some aren't. Um, I, I, I do, um, that we do have like an entire like services organization to help customers with that. But also in some capacity, yeah, we do, we do have an opportunity to, to, to speak into that. And I have a peer, um, whose actual education has a, has a, 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 a bachelor's in, in psychology. And he does a lot of that as well. Like he's, he's, he's a peer of mine. He's on my team, but he also does a lot of, you know, communicating around how do we need to think about how our organization is structured. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that if the, if the customer's open and, and if we have an opportunity, a lot of that, um, you know, is, is, is whether or not, um, they want to hear it, but I will say that some of my most rewarding interactions have been with customers who are really transparent, who want to get to know us and who really want to share what's going on. And they don't, they don't come to the conversation in an adversarial way. Um, and, and, and some customers, that's how they approach all their vendors, right? Like you are here to take me to the cleaners and I'm gonna, you know, and then they yeah. come in with a defensive posture. Um, the, the most rewarding, um, engagements. And I think the most fruitful for the customer is when they're able to come in and go, Hey, here are our goals. Here are our problems. Now you come tell us how you really think you can help solve them. Right. And then we have this very wonderful, like relational back and forth. That's, that's, that's what I find the most rewarding and, and the most fun, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I mean, it only takes a, the, the problem with tech sales is, uh, that it only takes a couple people trying to spiff out their number and sell somebody the wrong thing to hit their number or whatever it is. And it, and it brings that whole used car mentality fear of, you know, to customers. And, you know, the truth is, um, we're not selling used cars and a customer that buys something from a tech company, it, you know, it will probably need to stay a customer for years. And so managing that relationship is like really, really important. And, and screwing them over today to get your spiff is just extremely short sighted and damages the customer in a, in a way that that salesperson will, you know, will just pop smoke and be onto his next, co- you know, his or her next company. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's a problem. And it's, um, you know, sales is a challenge. Yeah, I think that's one thing that kind of helps us as technologists that like when we have kind of the, the skills and the, and, the, and the backbone to establish that level of trust at each rung of the ladder, right? Like even people at C-level, you know, can uh, the C-suite level is what I mean. So can see, you know, in our interactions that we know what we're talking about, but the, the you know, the task rabbits, the, the people that are doing the work, they can also see that. So it's, it's very important to kind of establish that. And, you know, once you're in sales, that's, that's a little bit harder to navigate, but, um, I assume on the, on the strategist side, do you kind of get to maintain that balance a bit since it's not purely monetary focused? Yeah, well, it, so, I mean, I, I am in the sales org, right? I'm, my, my role is, 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 and I want to say pre-sales, but pre-sales isn't even right anymore because yeah. with, you know, with cloud technology, it's all about consumption, right? So just because a You're customer always. says, Hey, we're, you know, we, we, you know, we, we're going to sign a contract and we are committed to you. Right. They still, if they don't consume, we don't get paid, yeah. um, as, as a company. And, and so, um, there is vested interest for me to make them successful. Um, that, you know, that, that's really what I'm here to do is how to, you know, and, and, you know, and, and I've had customers I've worked with be like, you know, they told us when we really didn't, didn't have a good technology fit or, you know, they're not committed to us getting every single workload, regardless of whether or not it's, it's the right fit, you know? And I think, you know, you, you have to recognize that. And, and I, I think in general, you know, you can tell when somebody's genuinely concerned about helping you solve your problem and when, when they're not. And, um, and so that, that's just always been the approach that, that I try to take. 
Um, and I think most of the time it's, it's appreciated, but you know, you, you gotta let, I mean, people be people and, and some are gonna, you're gonna work really well with and some are, you know, you're just, ne- it's, you're never gonna hit it off. And that's, that's like, okay. You just, you just gotta kind of navigate that and figure it out as you go. It's funny because until you until you just said that, Yvonne, I didn't realize that we ba- you and I, I think, basically have the same job. I mean, I do it for I do it for Aviatrix, but my job at Aviatrix is to help customers find the right fit, whether it be, you know, us or not for every workload, which, you know, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it belong their workload belongs on prem or somewhere else, but to help them navigate their requirements and help them, you know, consume and, and, you know, use Aviatrix and be successful using Aviatrix. That's, that's what I do. So it's, that's interesting. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes my job is to help them think bigger, right. And to be like, okay, like you're focused on this little point solution, but what if you increase the aperture a little bit, but sometimes it's also to be like, Hey, you're trying to boil the ocean. Let's divide this up into smaller achievable bits so that you can show progress, so that you can go back to the business and say, hey, we did this thing and it was yep. successful. And and now we have the credibility to do the next thing. Right. So all of that and, and some of it's like just like taking your best guess, like and you don't always get it right either. Um, but, uh, you, you know, you give it your best shot. And you try to be relational and. Get to know people and, um, you know, apologize when you get it wrong and Just move do forward. By, do right by the customer generally. Yeah. I mean, that's the, yeah. that's the point, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, I mean, I think we're actually rolling up on time here. Wow. It like went super fast. <laughs> it's really great to talk to you and, and really easy to, to listen, uh, to what you have to say, Yvonne. So thank you for, uh, for being with us tonight. Um, guys, uh, Alex, Chris, is there anything else we, that you guys want to say or, or ask Yvonne while we've got her? I, I feel like we're going to have to have her back <laughs> sometime in the future. Cause yeah, for there's sure. plenty of more questions I I'd love to ask, especially about just mindset and approaching things and, you know, we, uh, advice, like how to, what like advice started, you would give yeah. for, for your path and all this. So, yeah, it was a great conversation. Uh, like Tim said, you say a, a lot of things that are, are really easy to listen to. So uh, it was, it was mm-hmm. awesome having you on. Yeah, ha- happy to be here. And I almost always have an opinion. So um, happy happy to come back yeah, anytime. Don't we'll, have, we'll have much more time to do the podcast whenever AI gets us to the point of the three-day work week. So um, we'll have plenty of time to chat about who God knows what. You know? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> podcast would, Tuesday. Okay, I, you know, I, as, if we're going to talk strategy, I would like not <laughs> bet on that one. This is now a gambling <laughs> podcast. Uh, yeah, I, I am. I am. I am. I am not a wagerer, but if I were, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, bet on a three day work week anytime soon, unless you're going to be self employed and uh, and and controlling the, uh, the spigot of work. Actually, uh, real quick, when, when you mentioned that, uh, I, I don't remember, I'll have to look it up because I, I think you're right on the name, but uh, that law, basically, the, the, the wider you open the spigot, the more rushes in to fill it. Anybody in networking already knows that one really well because whatever you upgrade your, your bandwidth, <laughs> immediately it's consumed. You went from one gig to 10 gigs, you're already at 10 gigs. You should have gotten 20. My, my favorite analogy was always bandwidth is like closet space. No matter how much you have, you fill it up. Like, <laughs> yep. that's great. Absolutely true. Yep. All right, guys. Well, let's wrap up. Um, if you uh, like what you heard tonight, uh, please uh, like and subscribe and uh, subscribe to our YouTube. Listen to us on your paper, podcatcher and uh, we'll get all of Yvonne's information in the show notes. So just in case you're one of the three people on the Internet who doesn't know her already. <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us tonight, everybody. Hi, everyone. It's Tim. And this has been the Cables to Clouds podcast. Thanks for tuning in today. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe to us in your favorite podcast catcher, as well as subscribe and turn on notifications for our YouTube channel to be notified of all our new episodes. Follow us on socials at Cables2Clouds. You can also visit our website for all the show notes at Cables2Clouds.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.